very happy to be amongst all of you all here today and very grateful to all of you all that you have taken out your valuable time to be here i can see so many very well known faces so many faces that you know i knew for so many years but some way we disconnected and then again you all are here i'm very happy to see all of you all so as we are on this two day journey together trying to understand life and aspects of relationship through the ramayana and the mahabharat just to give you some background to whatever i'm going to speak today and tomorrow so everything i'm going to speak is based on the book open air meditations as uh, it's already been introduced of course the book is with avail available with all of you all so it will be more like a revision it will be more like your hand notes that you all will carry back home i can tell you one thing for sure this is not a book that you would want to read once you have to keep reading it at least 10 15 times to kind of feel that you have actually read the book because um as i said this book is called as open eyed meditations so it has to be read in a meditative way because the way in which this book has been written has been over a period of time um the reason i called it as open eyed meditations the title of the book was actually most obvious because that's the way i i wrote the book whatever i would observe in the world as i moved around traveled around met people so and many people would ask me questions so everything i observed i kind of went back contemplated on it meditated on it and wrote an article so all these there are about 64 meditations in the book each of these meditations have a story behind them so if somebody asks me where the story came from i can tell you how i thought about that particular meditation you know so it's it's kind of happened in that way only the scriptures um in the vedic culture there is a word which is known as shastra chakshu shastra chakshu means seeing the eyes through the words of the scriptures so sorry seeing the world through the eyes of the scriptures that means as you keep coming through different instances in your life different situations in your life if you can find some link or some connection or some story some reference in the scripture that can help you give a solution or some insight into the particular situation that you are going through that's what is called shastra chakshu so this book open eye meditations is actually an english version of the word shastra chakshu if i call it shastra chakshu nobody will buy it you know in the market nobody knows what it means they call it open eye meditations people are like intrigued you know so many people have asked me what is this new technique of meditation opening eyes i said you have to read the book to find out i don't tell them what it is <laughs> anyways with that as a background uh would like to start so today we're going to discuss this uh topic known as life apps almost every person today whatever you go through in your life is revolving around apps literally yeah. there is an app for jogging to kind of find uh, find out how much steps you have jog there is an app naturally to wake you up in the morning there is an app to even chant you know there is a i bead you click on it it is like a wooden bead you have to click on the screen and the count keeps increasing so practically of all aspects of life there are you know apps now and therefore the question is is there are there apps that can actually help us deal with problems of life and that's what this session is about life apps so many times when people come to sessions like this or i'm sure you must have attend, attended many other sessions or seen videos or heard uh, talks sometimes a question is asked what we hear why doesn't it register or why don't we actually apply what we hear i'll tell you a story by the way i'm going to tell you a lot of stories in the next two days so if you get nothing else at least you'll get good stories to hear basically yeah that's like the basic thing you will get 
Anyway, beyond that, if you get something more, that's great. So, um, one disciple went to his guru and he asked him that, I attend so many satsang programs, so many years I've attended, but somehow or the other, nothing changes in my life. Why doesn't anything change? So this guru, he told him, I will not tell you, I will not give you an answer, I will demonstrate why it is not changing, why things are not happening to you. So he told him, go and get one bottle of liquor. So his disciple became bewildered. You know. So guru is asking to get a bottle of liquor. So this disciple anyway went and got a bottle of liquor. Now the guru told him, start drinking it. So he got even more bewildered. Then the guru told him, make sure that not even one drop of liquor actually goes below your throat. So this disciple, he drank, and before it actually entered, he spit it out. Then he drank a little more, before it entered, he spit it out. Like that, the entire bottle got completed. So the guru asked him, you drank one full bottle, are you drunk now? The disciple said, what are you joking? He said, not even one drop has actually entered below my throat. So how will I get drunk? The Guru said, that's exactly what happens in satsang program. When we come to a program, we hear, but actually nothing really enters into our heart. We're not really hearing with the intent of absorbing it and applying it. So till we have this, what is known as applicative hearing, transformation will not happen. And therefore, the title of today's session itself is Life Apps. That means it's about applying what you hear in your life. Yes, what you may hear is a lot. But even if you can apply a few principles which are something that really touches your heart, I think it's worth it. And of course, if you say that I don't remember everything, you still have a book. Whatever I'm going to speak is in the book also. So then you can go back and refer to the book again, read whatever you, you heard, and then try to apply. So this way it goes much deeper. And if you actually want to hear it again, we are also recording it on video. We'll put it on YouTube and you can hear again. So the whole purpose is application. It's not just a one-time hearing effort. It's actually an application effort. The responsibility to change is ours. The responsibility to experience a transformation is ours. At max, what people can do for you is give you some direction and guidance. But the responsibility is solely each individual's. I'm sure you all have heard of the story of a king who wanted to do a massive Abhishek in, one, in a temple. So he ordered every citizen of his kingdom to come with a glass of milk and put it in one big drum. The next day morning when the king went over there and saw inside the drum, there was not even one drop of milk, only water. The whole drum filled with water. Because every citizen felt that I am not responsible for, the, for getting milk. And let everybody else get milk, I'll get water, what difference it makes. One glass of water doesn't make a difference in a drum. So eventually, everybody ended up getting only a glass of water. So most people feel the responsibility of change is not mine. I come to a program, I come to a guru, I come to a teacher. The responsibility of change is the teachers. If transformation doesn't happen with me, then you say, Are, Prabhuji ne barabar nahi bataya. So the responsibility lies with each one of us. Whether we want to change or no is our problem because it's our responsibility. Best what can be given to you is some direction and some guidance. The greatest wisdom in life lies in the simplest of stories, actually. If you have heard of the story of Shivaji Maharaj, when he was um, in Agra, imprisoned for a certain amount of time, and somehow he escaped. And while he was running away, he was kind of lost in a, um, in a foresty area. He was very hungry. And somehow he found a small hut, and he was he was desperate for some food. He went and asked, he went and begged literally for some food. And that lady, she was happy to serve him simple rice and dal. So Shivaji Maharaj sat down to eat that simple rice and dal. She put it on a banana plate, flat.
flat plate. And when she poured the dal on the rice, the dal started flowing away. And this lady, when she saw the dal flowing away, she just made a remark. She said, you're eating rice dal like Shivaji Maharaj. So she didn't know he was Shivaji Maharaj. You know? so, so he was struck by that comment. So she said, if you have to eat rice dal properly, make a hole in between, make a boundary of rice within which you should have dal. That gave Shivaji Maharaj the wisdom to actually think about a strategy for his empire. He went back, so essentially what the, what the old lady meant to say was that Shivaji Maharaj had a powerful empire, but he didn't have a proper boundary protecting that empire. And therefore everything was flowing away. The enemies were taking away everything. So essentially, sometimes the greatest wisdom lies in the simplest of stories. And therefore, the Indian epics, especially the Mahabharata, especially the Ramayana, if you look at the Hitopadesh, the Panchatantra, practically all the epics are in the form of stories. Why? The reason is because stories convey some message that the deepest of philosophies cannot convey. And the stories also have the ability to give the message in an emotional way. And therefore, it is very important to understand the Indian context in which the stories are built. Of course, Indians are very good in application. Therefore, most problem solutions, the companies lie in India. If you look at Microsoft, if you look at TCS, if you look at some of the biggest companies around the world, most of their employees are Indians because their ability to solve problems is very high. And here are some examples of how Indians can handle complicated problems in simple ways. This is an interesting way to prevent shoes from getting robbed, chappal from getting stolen. You know. Our temple, many brahmacharis use this very diligently. Here is a very innovative way of cooking. And here is a chapati belan liquor bottle used. And this is a unique way of hearing music. And this is a table, modified table. And here is a modified bike, modified two-wheeler to accommodate one more. And here is height of tolerance, handling a lot of people. And this is something that no Westerner can think of. <laughs> Taking a train or a truck. <laughs> and look at this lady. Highly innovative. People will be inspired to eat her, you know, her uh, items because she's cooking in the Mars, in the, in, on the moon. So essentially, India is known for its innovation, what we call as Jugad. And therefore, from where did all this intelligence come from? It all comes from just simple stories from the Ramayana and Mahabharata. So here, I'm going to share with you all some seven concepts of life. Each of them is going to be called as self-something. So the first concept is known as self-image. So the first concept which is, so each of these concepts that I'm going to speak about, I'm not sure how many I'll be able to speak, depending on the time. Each of these concepts that I'm going to speak about have several stories connected to them or several themes connected to them. But there's a broad theme called self-image. The first concept that I would like to share is a concept which is known as who controls my opinions and decisions? People with a very weak self-image, they look for approval from others to upgrade themselves. Four personalities in the Mahabharata teach us how to and how not to develop our self-image. The first personality is Dhritarashtra. So Dhritarashtra was always weak and helpless. Because his mother had closed her eyes to his needs. So essentially, when Dhritarashtra, before Dhritarashtra was born, 
when his mother was going to conceive him, she closed his eye, her eyes because Vyasadev, who was Dhritarashtra's father, was extremely ugly and extremely, you know, um, different looking. So she just closed her eyes and the result of was that Dhritarashtra was born, who was blind. So Dhritarashtra from his childhood was raised blind. Later on, when uh, he married Gandhari, thinking that Gandhari will assist him in his needs. So instead of she assisting Dhritarashtra in his needs, she also adopted the self-image of Dhritarashtra. She closed her own eyes to his needs. So her mother, his mother closed her eyes first, then Gandhari, his wife also closed her eyes. So now, so here is a combination of two people, both of them having weak self-images. Gandhari had a very weak self-image. Dhritarashtra had a very weak self-image. The combination of the two was Duryodhan, who had a very hollow self-image of himself. So the result, so how do we understand Gandhari had a very uh, weak self-image? When she was giving birth, she was having a child and the children in a womb, Kunti gave birth first. Her um, sister-in-law, she gave birth first. And as soon as Kunti gave birth first, Gandhari couldn't handle it. And she hit her own womb out of frustration, out of great envy. So when she hit her womb, that hit became like a psychological slap on the self-image of Duryodhan who was inside her womb. So the result was when Duryodhan was born, he was constantly feeling hollowness within. Why? Because he was born with a low self-image. And the result was that he was always craving for things to fill himself up, wealth, resources, followers, power, position, so that he can fill up his hollow self-image. In the same family was born Yudhishthir, the second personality. So Yudhishthir also was born in a very bad setting. His father was not in the, uh, not in the palace. He was in the forest. He voluntarily gave up the kingdom. But instead of Yudhishthir being developed with a hollow self-image, Yudhishthir became a very powerful person with a great self-image. Because his father taught him to prioritize values over things. Pandu, his father, never bothered about things, never bothered about position, never bothered about power, but he bothered about value systems. And that's what he imbibed in Yudhishthir. The third personality who we study in the Mahabharata is another person who has a totally different mindset. Another factor that plays a role in defining your self-image is skills. Those who have great skills, they generally think that it's supposed to be that they have a great self-image. But interestingly, exhibition of great skills does not mean you have a great self-image. The example is Karna in the Mahabharata. He had the best of skills, but he had no self-confidence. He constantly needed somebody else's approvals, others' approval to convince him that he is good. So essentially, when Karna was born, Kunti abandoned him. And because Kunti abandoned him, that abandonment became a psychological slap on the self-image of, of Karna. So he grew up with an inferiority complex. So Gandhari, her first son Duryodhan, grew up with the inferiority complex. Why? Because her, his mother hit her womb out of envy. That became like a psychological slap on his self-image. Karna was born with an inferiority complex because his mother Kunti abandoned him. And that became a psychological slap on the self-image of Karna. And somewhere deep down within himself, though he was extremely skilled, he was not at peace with himself. But interestingly, if you study the fourth personality in the Mahabharata, which is Krishna, he also was abandoned by his parents, if you see from a practical point of view. As soon as Krishna was born, he was sent to Mathura. Uh, he was sent from Mathura to Vrindavan. So Vasudevan Devaki never really did anything for him in that sense. You know, they also kind of abandoned him, you can say. But the atmosphere in which Krishna was born and he was in which he grew up in Vrindavan, it was filled with unlimited amount of love. 
and because he was filled with so much love he never looked for approval from others he developed into a completely unique personality and he fit into so many roles from a coward to a wrestler to a king to a king maker to a driver to a messenger to a friend to an advisor to a lover krishna had no problem fitting in any role and he had no problem with his self image because he was filled with love therefore he could love give love and great confidence to others so essentially the understanding of this particular analysis is that when love shapes your self image you mirror extreme confidence but when things and approval shape your self image you mirror reacting to others desires so you find yudhishthir and krishna having lot of love within their hearts filled with love and therefore they were greatly confident in themselves and they could give love to others and karna and dhritarashtra because their self image sorry karna and duryodhan because their self image was low because they didn't experience that kind of love that krishna and yudhishthir experience because of that they hankered either things or they hankered approval from others thomas edison he had a very interesting way of uh, selecting people to become his employees work for him he would do a regular interview first and just before deciding whether to hire a person or no he would take that person out for dinner and while conversing during the dinner he would eat something and he would say this this has less salt and he would add some salt into his item and he would observe what the other fellow is doing if the if the candidate put salt in his food without tasting it he would not select him if he tasted first and then select then put salt or didn't then he would select him why because edison was thinking whether this fellow has a closed mind or an open mind most people when they know that they are going to work under somebody and if they have a low self image of themselves they will do what pleases the boss they will do what pleases the person they are going to work for which means they actually completely close minded they are just not thinking for themselves so many people in this world have a very low self image about themselves and the reason is because somewhere in the background there is a psychological slap on their self image by somebody either the parents or by the teacher or by somebody whom they have been connected with and that affects the self image for life there are two things two words one is love and one is attachment many people think that love and attachment are exactly same thing there is no difference between love and attachment but there is actually a big difference what is the difference the difference between love and attachment is a difference between a plastic flower and a real flower a plastic flower looks exactly like a real flower texture at least the look and feel of it it can even smell like a real flower nowadays yeah. of course plastic flowers are much more durable last for longer period of time you know you can have multiple uses of a plastic flower you know but the difference between a plastic flower and a real flower is that the plastic flower doesn't have life the difference between love and attachment is that attachment doesn't have life love has life a real flower has life and that's what makes it beautiful what is an attachment attachment leads to anxiety when there is intense attachment the attachment leads to anxiety and that anxiety after a little more while it leads into fear and that fear after a little more while leads to madness for example if a child is gone to school and he's supposed to come back by say 2 o'clock so there is expectation that the child will come at 2 but if the child doesn't come by 3 then that expectation that attachment leads to anxiety by 3 o'clock the mother is anxious if the child doesn't come till 
then that anxiety tends to become fear. Now she is fearful. And the child doesn't come by six, she is mad. Now it has gone to madness level. So essentially, most people in this world are actually attached to the other person. Actually, the difference between attachment and love is that attachment weakens you and love empowers you. When love shapes your self-image, you mirror extreme confidence. And when things and approval shape your self-image, you mirror reacting to others' desires. So essentially, the difference between love and attachment is that love actually makes you more stronger from within. And attachment actually makes you more weaker from within. And therefore, what we experience in this section of the Mahabharat, Karna and Duryodhan, they were filled with attachment to things, to position, to approvals. And, Yudhish, and, Karan, and Krishna and Yudhishthir, they were filled with love. And that love helped them empowered and made them confident in themselves. Self-image is often about how we analyze situations in our life. This is known as paralysis by analysis syndrome. There are many people in this world who get so paralyzed by analyzing. I often tell the story of a grasshopper who was expert in dancing. And this grasshopper just loved to dance. As soon as there was music, this grasshopper would start dancing. One time there was an ant who was observing this grasshopper dance. Sorry. Um, there's a caterpillar, hundred-legged caterpillar, and uh, that was dancing, you know, centipede, caterpillar, whatever you call it. So there was a, um, a grasshopper who was observing this centipede dance, and this centipede was fantastic in his dancing. So the grasshopper went to him and asked him a question. He said, how do you dance so well? Do you put your 100th leg before your 50th leg or you put your 22nd leg before your 31st leg? How do you exactly do it? The centipede got confused because nobody asked him such a question and he never th thought also about such a question. You know? And then he decided, next time I dance, I'll observe. And then he started dancing. He started observing which leg came where. He got so confused that he just couldn't dance only. That was the end of his dancing career. You know? Many times in life, human beings also go through this paralysis by analysis syndrome. That means when they experience some problem in their life, when they experience a particular situation in their life, they start analyzing it, over-analyzing it, over-over-analyzing it so much that they actually end up doing nothing. Paralysis. And I'm sure in today's world, this is most common. I go through one problem, I analyze that problem so much because I want to know exactly what the consequences are. Overanalyze, overanalyze, overanalyze. And especially when it comes to others. When it comes to analyzing others' behavior, we become over, over, over analytical. You know. And then we end up messing up relationships. We end up messing up our life badly. Complexity is outside slowly percolate and become complexities inside. Simplicity is about living in the present moment with gratitude and satisfaction. And complexity is about sulking over past events with great anxiety and ruminating over future happenings, what is going to happen in future. In the Ramayana, there is a very interesting story, very small aspect of the Ramayana, but it's very thought provoking. When Ram was told that he is going to be banished, he was going to be sent on exile for 14 years, Ram, he didn't overanalyze his um, banishment. If you study that section of the Ramayana, when Kaikai tells him that you have to go 14 years for exile, Ram doesn't at all argue with her. He doesn't at all discuss. He doesn't at all analyze the whole exile. You study the entire Ramayana, not even one section you'll find 
where ram is analyzing why it happened to me why where ram is actually analyzing did do i deserve it he doesn't just doesn't over analyze at all so the thing is he took the whole thing in such a simple manner that it, he accepted it as an unchangeable reality and he embraced it gracefully over analysis is a result of two things there are two reasons why people over analyze in life first there is blind over confidence in oneself and second there is utmost insecurity about oneself both of them lead to over analysis a person who over analysis over analyzes is like a circuit electronic circuit that carries too much negative charge you know if you study electronics you will understand this if a circuit carries too much ele electric negative charge it blasts it bursts out so a person who is too much over analytical is actually filled with too much negativity and very soon he is in the process of self formulation he will just blast from within when you fly in an airplane almost every time you hear this announcement that one has to switch off all phones you know why that announcement is made it's actually a philosophical announcement whenever i hear that announcement i start thinking philosophically about it you know it actually means when one is going to a higher plane you should switch off all connection to lower planes that means for somebody to go higher in one's thought process one has to disconnect from lower thought processes only they can go and be comfortable on higher thought processes so that means instead of over -analy analyzing we need to have a way to upgrade our mind here is something from the mahabharat that teaches us a very interesting way of overcoming coming this paralysis by analysis syndrome in the mahabharat arjun he was cursed by urvashi when arjun went to the heavenly planets urvashi came up to him and she proposed to him she wanted to unite with him arjun said no i consider you to be my mother because she was the wife of one of his ancestors urvashi got so angry at arjun that she cursed him that he'll become a yuna so arjun instead of being affected by that curse he accepted that curse as a gift of life arjun did not over analyze his decision after the after getting the curse he didn't they oh i should have said no to her he didn't over analyze his decision and neither did he over analyze her intentions what he did he accepted that curse as a gift of life and then later on at a much later stage in his life when um, yudhishthir his own brother he was in the middle of the war there was a particular episode particular instance where yudhishthir got wild on arjun because Arj um, yudhishthir was defeated by karna very badly insulted very badly and yudhishthir was frustrated angry and he was expecting that arjun will kill karna and come to him but arjun came running to him thinking that his brother is hurt so when asno arjun came and yudhishthir asked him did you kill karna and arjun um, had not so he told him no then yudhishthir started blasting arjun like anything he fired him left right center and just because yudhishthir fired him so much, and finally yudhishthir told him you are such a useless person that you should throw your gandhi bow useless carrying that bow arjun got so offended by that he actually took out his sword to go and kill yudhishthir kill his own brother and both of them can you imagine arjun and yudhishthir fighting with each other like anything when arjun made that mistake he actually started over analyzing like anything and then there was another episode where arjun had to um, go into the chamber of yudhishthir and draupadi when they were uh, alone because his bow was lying inside there 
So the condition was if any brother goes to the other brother's uh, room when Draupadi is with that person, that person has to go on exile for 12 years. Yudhishthir said, told Arjun the, the next day, you don't have to go on exile because I, I, do, I have not taken offense. And you are my younger brother, younger brother is like a son only. So he said, no problem. Arjun said, nothing doing. I will go. So essentially, look at how Arjun dealt with this over analysis syndrome. When it came to analyzing other people, analyzing Urvashi, her actions, analyzing Yudhishthir, his actions, he used uh, simplicity or he used just analysis as a tool. But when it came to analyzing his own actions, his own mistakes, he used over analysis as a tool. What we do is exactly opposite. When it comes to analyzing others' mistake, we use over analysis. Unlimited time, our processor runs faster. But when it comes to analyzing our mistake, we use justification as a tool. Simplicity. We talk about how simple we are. Never made any mistake only in my life. You know. How can I make a mistake? So when it comes to ourselves, we use analysis of simplicity. When, we come, when it comes to others, we use over analysis of complexity. And therefore, it is important to understand, just like Arjun, he overanalyzed his own actions and simply analyzed other people's actions with compassion. There are four ways in which we can deal with others. This is known as spiritual intelligence. It's progressive in nature. The first way to deal with others is known as apathy. Apathy means I don't care and you are not important to me. The second way to analyze others is known as sympathy. That means I see you and I feel sorry for you. That's all. I don't, want, I, don't, I don't go any further than that. Just sympathize with you. The third way is empathy. That means I feel for you. I see you. I see you suffering. I feel for your suffering. And I actually can share your suffering from within my heart. I actually feel for your suffering so intensely. And the fourth level of this is known as compassion. Compassion means I not just feel for you, I feel for your suffering, but I also act skillfully to relieve you of your suffering. That's compassion. So essentially, a good human being is one who shows compassion towards others and doesn't show apathy towards others. But unfortunately, we do exactly opposite. That's why our spiritual intelligence is not developed. When it comes to ourselves, we show compassion. Our own mistakes, we show compassion. Our own weaknesses, we show compassion. But when it comes to others' mistakes, we show apathy. So over-analysis, essentially, this particular paralysis of analysis syndrome t tells us that when it comes to ourselves, we have to show apathy. That means don't um, show kindness to your weaknesses. Don't show kindness to your um, mistakes. But when it comes to others, we should show compassion. The third thing that we learn in the self-image aspect is that today there is a disease. This is known as like disease. Do likes make my life. As soon as you do something in your life, you put it on Facebook, you put it on Instagram, you put it on you know, Twitter, you put it on LinkedIn, you put everywhere and wait. Kya bolte log? How many likes do you get which actually shows that you're doing well in life? So the sure shot formula for a life of misery is to allow others' ratings of your actions to determine, determine your self-rating. So most people allow other people's actions or other rating of your actions to decide what is your self-rating. You don't rate yourself. When you do something, you don't rate yourself because you have no opinion yourself, of yourself. You wait for others to form their opinion. And based on their opinion, you make your opinion. Unfortunately today, human beings tend to see themselves through the lenses of others' approval. 
and this is what makes life completely miserable thumbs up means you are doing very well in life thumbs down means you are doing miserable in life so everything has become thumbs up and thumbs down now and that's how we rate ourselves in the mahabharat there is one personality who was exactly like this fortunately social media was not there at that point of time otherwise he would have been quite miserable you know and this is the personality of karna he eagerly sought approval from others and he judged his own worthiness by his success in terms of exhibiting his talent and by his success in terms of ratings that other gave his performance we find just before the kurukshetra war there was a meeting of all the kauravas and their soldiers they are the generals and bhishma was the commander in chief of the kaurava army he was doing a rating analysis of what are the strengths and weaknesses of his team that was done generally before the war and different people were giving different ratings so a maharathi means somebody who can kill thousands of people at a time so somebody who got the title maharathi is considered to be like the best among the warriors get the best facilities given the best of roles so um karna so when all the people were given their ratings bhishma was calling drona as maharathi duryodhana as maharathi dushasana maharathi like that many people were getting maharathi ratings and ashwathama was given the rating of rathi like not really that great rating and interestingly bhishma gave karna the rating of ardha rathi half a rathi you know karna couldn't handle it karna was expecting maharathi rating you know because that's that's the kind of skill that he had but bhishma's analysis what karna is ardharathi karna blasted out on bhishma bhishma gave a logical answer why he is calling him ardharathi it's not that he was biased or anything like that he he said that the reason he is calling karna ardharathi was because karna had a curse that when he needed the knowledge the most he would forget it and bhishma said anybody who was cursed that at the most crucial time of his life most crucial war of his life he loses knowledge that person is useless and he, and he said he is ardharathi karna couldn't handle it and he took a vow that he will not enter the battle till bhishma is alive so practically of the 18 days of war 10 days karna didn't come only because bhishma gave him bad rating can you imagine if karna was an employee in today's organization you know, what would happen to him when you need that follow the most he is missing what kind of friendship is this and what kind of loyalty is this so karna's heroism crumbled down with bhishma's words he felt that by declaring uh, him as a ardharathi bhishma had declared him as good for nothing in life bhishma never told that karna is useless in life he only said as a warrior he is ardharathi but karna took it like he is saying that i am useless in life by giving him that rating so essentially a insecure person behaves like a extremely hungry person he seeks attention in mitigating his psychological hunger pang pangs there is a psychological hunger for approval for attention for you know uh, for rating him and essentially karna he was um, his it was void incompleteness of his self esteem and his uh, determin or, or rather his need for others approval for him for doing was not enough the world has to endorse that he is actually good in what he is doing so karana sought that kind of approval so essentially a human being when a person doubts himself he actually hates himself and when you hate yourself you are actually proclaiming enmity with yourself so what karna did essentially was by giving rating so much importance he was actually letting himself down quite a bit the scriptures give a very important solution to this kind of mindset rather than looking at others for approval rather than competing with others the scriptures advises compete with yourself 
don't compete with others don't think it just because he is a maharathi i need to be a maharathi just because he has so many thousands of facebook friends i will also need i will buy facebook friends i'll buy page likes it doesn't make any sense doing it artificially just to show the world that i am great the question is are you convinced that you're great are you convinced about your own self image and that's what we need to ask ourselves again and again there was this war between coke and pepsi at some point of time in the past when both were starting up and both companies were doing extremely well and they were like really intensely competing with each other and at a certain point both the teams were thinking how to outdo one another and then they had a meeting the coke team they had a meeting with each uh, among the whole uh, marketing venture and they realized that rather than competing with pepsi what we need to do is think about how to increase our sale so then they did a survey of the entire uh, united states trying to see what is the way, amount of um, any kind of soft drinks that people drink in the world then they found out that every day a uh, average american consumes about 30 ml of soft drinks so they said now our target is make every american an average american drink 300 ml of soft drink every day that was their target so they said how do you achieve this target so now till now they were thinking of how to compete and sell more than pepsi now they started thinking completely differently they forgot pepsi they started thinking how will we sell more and make every person drink 300 ml of, of uh, coke every day so then they realized whenever anybody felt thirsty somebody one of them gave an idea whenever anyone felt thirsty there should be a coke machine close by and that's when they started this whole idea of vending machines and from that point onwards the story of coke and pepsi changed completely pepsi literally vanished and coke is like literally everywhere the reason was they simply stopped competing and they started focusing on how they can do better so there are three ways in which or other four ways in which people look at life the first way is win lose for me to win you have to lose the first mindset for me to win others have to lose the second mindset is if i have to lose then somebody else has to win people who have this mindset consider themselves to be weak and they are very easy to get stepped on and such a person wants to be very nice with everybody but in that process they give a lot of pressure to themselves so such people they are constantly depressed and they hide their feelings within the third type of mindset is if i lose you also lose this is known as downward spiral so in this mindset if i am going down i will take you along with me i will not go down alone yeah. so here when uh, where a person wins or lose they want to do it together i can't allow you to win and if i have to lose i will take you also along with me lower the fourth type of mindset is i will also win you also win this is a mindset which is known as a mindset of celebration so here in such a mindset the whole idea behind it is everyone can win together and such people who have this kind of mindset they don't mind sharing they don't mind um, you know connecting with the other person making sure that that person also wins i also win so here is a very interesting quote which says when i turns into v illness turns into wellness so for such people who are always thinking of likes and their own self image they should actually start becoming a little broader and think about how people can win together 
it's not that for me to win, you have to lose, or you, for you to um, win, I have to lose. Both can win together. The second concept is a no concept which is known as self-satisfaction. Every human being has to have this in life to experience joy. Here is a very interesting article that I wrote, which is known as, do I shop what I need or need what I shop? So the question is, is shopping your need or is it your hobby? I know so many people who shop just for fun or they shop because it's an addiction. I don't, I feel I've not done something till I shop, you know. So essentially in the Mahabharata, there were two shopping freaks or two people who are like intensely into shopping. You, know. you must be wondering what is this in Mahabharata shopping? Tha kya? The concept was there, definitely. But I'll tell you in the application in a totally different way. There were two people, Ashwatthama and Arjun, who were always trying to upgrade their weapons. Essentially, they were shopping for weapons, basically. So Ashwatthama was a shopping freak. And Ashwatthama, he owned a jewel. There was a jewel on his head. And the result of having the jewel was that he need not be afraid of enemies. There was no disease that could affect him. No hunger could never affect him. He would never be thirsty in his life. And no living being could harm him. Practically, he could never die. Unfortunately, though this jewel was on his head, he never believed in the power of the jewel. And he never thought that this jewel is actually effective. He had no confidence in it. And therefore, every time he was in trouble, every time somebody came chasing after him, he was, he was in trouble, he would run to his father for protection. Can you imagine somebody who had a jewel which said that he could never die? He had a jewel that said that he could never get you know, killed by any living being. But still he would run to his father, Dronacharya, every time for protection. It's like, you know, many years back I had gone on a train journey. And there was one fellow sitting next to me. He seemed to be like a villager. But uh, suddenly he took out an iPhone 5. At that time it was like very rare to have an iPhone. He took out an iPhone 5. And he's asking the fellow who was sitting next to him, Thoda laga ke dona. He didn't know how to use it only. So he had it. So Ashwatthama is like that, you know. Somebody who had a high-end mobile without knowing how to use it only. So essentially, Ashwatthama was like a adamant child. He demanded and coerced his father to give him the Brahmastra. He didn't deserve it. He was not qualified for it. But he pushed him to get the Brahmastra. Therefore, it says, if you desire what you deserve, then it will come to you. But if you deserve what you, if you desire what you don't deserve, then you start running after it. Ashwatthama desired two things. One is Brahmastra. He forced his father to give it to him. And the second thing he uh, desired was Krishna Sudarshan Chakra. So one day he went to Krishna Dwaraka and he told Krishna, my dear Krishna, can you give me your Sudarshan Chakra and in exchange I will give you Brahmastra. Can you imagine his audacity, you know. So it's not that he was satisfied with the Brahmastra. This is a problem with shopping, you know, too much shopping. It's not that the shopping freak is going to be satisfied with what he buys. After he buys, he will think again, Are, ye nahi tha. Ja ke exchange karke aate you know? So that's the problem with Ashwatthama. He bought, he got the Brahmastra after forcing his father somehow. Then he went to Dwarka and exchange, he's trying to exchange it with uh, Krishna. St exchange offer started at that time. You know? And he's, so Krishna told him, hey, I mean, what will you do with the Sudarshan Chakra? I can give it to you, no problem, you try to hold it. He released the Sudarshan Chakra and Ashwatthama tried to hold it. He couldn't handle the power of the Sudarshan Chakra and he fell down. So Krishna asked him, now tell me, why did you want the Sudarshan Chakra in first place? He said, I wanted Sudarshan Chakra so that I can kill you using it. Can you imagine how shameless he was? <laughs> Absolutely shameless. You know? So, this was the quality of Ashwatthama shopping. Then the second personality in the Mahabharata, Arjun, and his approach towards shopping. So rather than accumulating more, Arjun chose to find value in everything he had. Rather than dig in more places, 
Arjun decided to dig deep in one place. And rather than looking for rare jewels, he started cultivating the jewel of confidence in himself. Arjun never demanded anything from his father, nor from his guru. Because he knew that if he learned what he had to the maximum extent, and he utilized whatever he had to the maximum extent, it triggers what is known as the law of magnetism. Which means that if I use what I have to the best of my ability, more will come. And that's exactly what happened with him. He was, he was utilizing whatever he had to the best of his ability. Drona, his guru, being pleased with him, gave him the Brahmastra because he knew he deserved it. And therefore, Arjuna, he felt complete and whatever he had, he utilized to the best, of, uh, best possibility. Ashwatthama, he felt himself to be incomplete and because he felt himself to be incomplete, as soon as there is incompleteness, gratitude is absent. So mind is like a bottomless pit. How much ever you put in the mind, the mind will still feel empty. So the more effort you put it in, put in filling the mind like Ashwatthama, the more you will find it hollow. And the more effort you put in capping the mind with satisfaction, the more you'll find contentment in life and uh, happiness like Arjun did. Today, the world is filled with things, stuff, gadgets. Now the Karting Mass is coming. Recently, Shravan Mass passed. We keep doing all these fastings for auspicious months. There is another type of fasting suggested. Upavas from gadgets one day. <laughs> Try fasting from mobile phones, Facebook, you know, internet, television, WhatsApp, BBM, you know, Twitter. Try that for one day. Upavas, you know. And if you actually do this kind of upavas, God will really come down. He'll <laughs> say, Bachche mujhe rulayega kya? fasting <laughs> It's too much for God to handle this, this kind of fasting, you know. I mean, actual fasting from grains and, you know, fruits and all that, anybody can do. But fasting from this, impossible. Even if God comes and tells you, we'll give you anything, still people won't fast. They won't believe, you know. There was once a king. This king, he was celebrating his birthday the next day. He decided that the next morning, whoever I see first, I will make that fellow happy. I will give him anything he wants and make him happy. That's his way of celebrating his birthday. So when he got up and he started going out, the first thing he found is one bhikari, one beggar. So the king gave that beggar one bronze coin. So the beggar became extremely happy. So happy he was. Somehow that coin slipped off his hand and fell into the gutter. So this fellow put his hand inside the gutter to remove that coin. So the king felt very bad, very stinking type of gutter. The king said, call the, call the beggar and he said, I'll give you another coin, don't worry, forget that coin. He gave that coin to him. So the beggar became again happy, one more. He put it in his pocket. He went back again in the gutter and started removing that coin. The king said, come on, I already gave you one coin. The beggar said, no, one more. So king called him back. He said, I'll give you a silver coin, take. So he gave him a silver coin. The beggar became extremely happy. He put the silver coin in his pocket and again, again went back to the gutter to remove that bronze coin. The king was annoyed. He said, what kind of a fellow is this? He gave him a gold coin. He said, now at least be satisfied. He was overjoyed. He started praising the king like anything. Put it in his pocket, again went back to look for that. The king was frustrated at this point of time. He told him, see, I have taken a vow that unless I make one fellow happy, I will not celebrate, my birthday is not complete. Become happy, please. <laughs> and the king gave him a bag of gold coins. He said, take this bag of gold coins and become happy. This man, his joy knew no bounds. He was so happy with this bag of gold coins. And then again he went to the gutter. <laughs> the king said, what nonsense is this? Why are you going back to the gutter? The beggar said, no matter how much you give me, I will, I will not be satisfied till I get that coin that is inside. You know? 
that's the nature of people in this world that's the nature of the human mind the human mind has a tendency to be dissatisfied and feel incomplete no matter how much you give it that's the nature of a human mind and therefore unless we learn to cap this mind with satisfaction unless we learn to experience contentment in our life no matter how much you give it things the mind is not going to be happy and the mind is not going to be complete there was a there was a king who was dying and the physician told him there is only one cure for you the only cure is if you wear the shirt of the most happiest person in your kingdom then you will become all right the king said find that fellow and get his shirt over here his people started roaming around the entire kingdom trying to find the most happiest person in the kingdom finally they found one fellow most happiest person in the kingdom only one problem he didn't have a shirt also <laughs> so those who have a lot they don't have contentment and those who don't have anything they have a lot of contentment the next concept is about change can i change without changing most people feel that if i change my present situation then i'll be happy then i'll be satisfied in life unfortunately the prospects are always higher on the other side of the ocean the old olden time saying was the grass is green on the other side now the new saying prospects are higher on the other side of the ocean you go to any country people always look at the country on the other side of the ocean and they look for happiness there you know i can give you a guarantee no country anybody is happy in the place they are in you know the bug of dissatisfaction or discontent is spreading like a epidemic and when you go into the temple we have this metal detector that detects metal in people just imagine there was a mental detector that detected discontent in people all the time it would be buzzing anybody who enters into the temple discontented only and people outside the temple also are equally discontented you know so practically everyone is so highly discontented the shrimad bhagavatam talks about a king whose name was sudyumna and this king he had a very interesting uh, discontent he wanted a sex change can you imagine bhagavatam 5000 years before also such stories are there so he went and prayed to lord shiva you know to bless him with a gender change somehow he entered into one particular forest and just by entering into that forest he changed into woman when he was a woman one king got attracted to him and he got married to him and he became pregnant but the problem with this boon that he got over sex change was that after one month he would again become male so one month female one month male one month female one month male this man was getting so crazy because not just change of body it's also change of mindset so the king was going crazy you know is not happy here also not happy there also so if somebody feels you know i am in the body of a female and i am frustrated i wish i was a male or somebody feels i am in the body of a male i am frustrated i wish i was a female you should read this story properly this fellow tried both and both places he couldn't find satisfaction basically so the desire for change comes from the fact that we focus on the limited negatives of our life rather than the unlimited positive that life has to offer so essentially when we look for change we are trying to escape into the world of what we don't have from the world of what we have so the mind is constantly exploring for reasons to be dissatisfied that is the past time of the mind minds daily past time look for reasons to be dissatisfied and if you give the mind a chance mind will give you 100 reasons why to be dissatisfied in life so just like waves in an ocean can never end 
Similarly, the change which list of the mind can never end. It keeps going on and on and on. In the Ramayana, there's a story of Vishwamitra Muni. So Vishwamitra was a king first. So he decided, if I become a Brahma Rishi, I'll be happy in life. So he took intense amount of trouble from becoming a king, from a king, he became a Raja Rishi, then he became a Maharishi, then he became a Brahma Rishi. After becoming a Brahma Rishi, after so much endeavor also, he realized being a Brahma Rishi is not easy. So essentially, he had, what Vishwamitra's realization at the end of such a massive change was that, he had definitely changed, but he had not grown. So unfortunately, instead of thinking of change, we should actually be thinking of growth. And therefore, when we look at people who are hankering for things and thinking that getting a new thing, I'll be happy. We should study some of these personalities in the, in the scriptures. Look at Krishna. What color of dhoti does Krishna wear? All the time yellow. What does he wear on his turban? A peacock feather, all the time. It's not that one day peacock feather, one day eagle feather, one day some other feather. All the time peacock feather, all the time yellow dhoti. Lord Ram taking this vow of Ekapatni Vrata. The sages, if you look at the lifestyle of the sages, every day same thing from morning to evening, exact same schedule. So essentially, why do these personalities have such steadiness? Because steadiness indicates satisfaction within. If somebody is steady outside, you understand that that person is satisfied inside. And therefore, satisfaction is about being happy with what life has to offer you. Most people in today's life they always look for something that will, uh, once the change happens, I'll be happy. There was a man, very poor man, he had a wife and he had six children, living in a one room house, packed up. You know. So one day he was like, you know, can you imagine six, seven, eight people living in one room? Can go crazy. You know. They were tripping on each other. They were like, you know, I mean, they were just not able to function in the house. So this man, he went to his uh, guru and he said, I am going to guru find solution. So he went to the guru and he st started telling him that please help me. So he said, we are miserable. We are fighting with each other, yelling at each other. The guru said, you do what I tell you and everything will be, you will be very happy in life. So the man said, of course, I'll do anything you tell me. So he said, how many animals do you own? The guru asked him. He said, I have one cow, one goat, and you know, few chicken. So the guru told him, you bring all the animals into your house. This man, he was shocked. He said, we already ate people. What if all these animals come? The guru said, just do what I say. This man, he, I mean, he had no idea what, he went, brought his cow inside, brought his goat inside, brought all the chicken inside. And there were eight people living with all these animals, you know. They were going crazy. The chicken was jumping on them when they were sleeping. The goat was, you know, making a sound. The cow was passing, you know, um, cow dung everywhere. After a week, this man went back to the guru. And he said, please help me. I am frustrated totally. The guru said, okay, um, take all the chicken out of your house. So this man took all the chicken out of his house. It's still the goat and the cow are like troubling us like anything. After a week he said, take the goat out. And then this man, he said, next week he went back. This cow is still passing dung all over. We don't know where to sleep also. Everywhere cow dung is there. You know. Guru said, take the cow out now. And then this man, when all the animals were out, just the eight of them were living. The place looked like heaven. No, yeah. This man went back to the guru and he said, thank you, you solved our problem. Now we are living in heaven actually. You know? The guru said, no problem. <laughs> Essentially, most people in life, they want change. 
material life mean change look at the four bottles four stages of life milk coke liquor and then there is a icu kit <laughs> so most people in life they feel change means something exciting is happening change is not necessarily exciting all the time change can be disastrous spiritually what is recommended is not change but growth there is a big difference between looking for change and looking for growth those who are thinking deeper they don't think of only changing they think of growing because they understand time is less just look at the graph this is a, a chart of what we do in life all life long if you observe carefully this chart you realize the actual only amount of time that you have free keeping aside your eating sleeping all that you know, work and all that is 9 years that's it 9 years that's it and if you really want to know how how less time you have left count the number of days in 9 years and collect small marbles or pebbles of that many number and you keep taking out one one pebble every day and you realize your number of pebbles is drastically reducing day by day that means the actual amount of time you have for spiritual growth is very very less the next thing is known as self analysis there is something known as positive chameleonism all of you have heard of chameleons right chameleons or chameleons whatever you call them they are things that color change color i was once um, in a terrace of our ashram in goa and i was chanting and there was this small chameleon sitting on our dhoti saffron dhoti hanging over there can you imagine for the first time i saw in my life that fellow took the exact color of the dhoti on which he was sitting exact color i was completely taken aback seeing the the chameleon sitting like that and that's when i got this idea of this article and i saw that changing of that color right in front of my eyes relationships are all about perspectives your perspective of looking at people and your perspective of looking at yourself so essentially what is positive chameleonism it is about learning to adopt oneself according to the color of the relationship and according to the color of the situation that you are in so here is a very interesting thought about three personalities in the ramayan that individually if you look at them they are incomplete ways of dealing with oneself and with the world but when you look at all three of them collectively that's exactly what a good human being is a combination of all the three the first is the is queen kaushalya the mother of ram So Kaut Kaushalya is a person who is thought oriented. She has learned to adapt to every situation and every relationship by philosophizing it. The second queen is Sumitra who is a very emotionally oriented person. She learns to look at life as and she when she looks at life she is looking for emotional fulfillment. That she feels is the essence of all relationships. The third queen Kai Kai she is an action oriented person she has to learn to observe minutely people's actions she kind of observes minutely people's actions and looking at their action she conclude what their intentions are these are three type of people that are often there in society and we may have one of the three also in us but actually life is about having all the three aspects i'll explain kaushalya her husband dasharath she he neglected her completely because he gave more attention to kai kai his third wife so kaushalya instead of focusing on why he is not giving why he is not giving me attention why he is not giving me time she just philosophically thought otherwise she started thinking if she if he is not giving me time and attention i'll use my time and attention in doing some service to society she opened a gurukul where 10000 students would study 
and she was personally managing the whole thing and doing so much for society sumitra was a very interesting person because when ram left ayodhya he met everyone in the family except sumitra ram went to kaushalya and took permission ram naturally saw kai kai and went he went to sita he went to lakshman he went to everyone except sumitra now generally if somebody had to think if you and me were in sumitra's place what we would have thought what nonsense is this ram didn't come to me that means he doesn't have any love for me any affection for me look at how sumitra thought sumitra was never bothered even one bit you know why because for her her experience of love and respect that ram had given her all through her life that was enough so that emotional fulfillment helped her remain unaffected apparently even though ram's action was wrong and the situation was wrong so sumitra was not affected by it at all because she thought of her emotional fulfillment that ram had already given her so much mantra the third person kai kai when mantra pointed out to kai kai that dasharath's action is wrong in coronating ram without bharat's presence immediately that omission of dasharath the wrong action of dasharath made kai kai doubt his intention itself so for kai kai type of people what people do is important people's behavior governs her behavior towards them how you behave with me i will behave like that only with you for sumitra type of people what people mean to do is more important than what they do so that means people's behavior don't affect her but their intentions affect her she knew even though ram didn't come he didn't it's not that his intention was not to come for kaushalya type of people neither other people's actions uh, affect her nor other people's intentions affect her what she thinks is important that means neither their behavior nor their intentions affect her because she chooses to focus on what gives her satisfaction there are these three types of people can be looked at from three different uh, examples kai kai type of person is like a roller coaster when a roller coaster goes on the road everything gets crushed below it so kai kai type of people they tend to be intolerant towards other people's inconsistent behavior that means if somebody else's action is inconsistent with her needs she becomes like a roller coaster full ayodhya gets crushed under her needs second sumitra type of people is like an ant if you look at an ant you observe an ant you put one finger in front of the ant the ant will go somewhere else you put another finger in front of the ant ant will go somewhere else the ant keeps changing direction no matter how many times you try to stop it sumitra type of people tend to adjust their life to accommodate the inconsistency of others and kaushalya is like an eagle if you look at look at an eagle eagle whenever it comes through problems it flies higher it goes to a higher dimension so kaushalya type of people focus on those aspects of life that uplift them rather than trying to get their hands dirty and their consciousness dirty in trying to meddle with lower aspects of life so essentially we need to learn from all the three we need to learn from sumitra that life is not black and white life has shades of gray that means whenever there is love there is implicit trust and even if there is every reason to doubt ram sumitra will not doubt ram because her intelligence is disciplined not to doubt uh, not to doubt the intention she has disciplined her intelligence not to doubt the intention of people she loves sumitra like people they know very well that the day intention is doubted that day relationship is finished kaushalya like people they learn how to deal with surprises that life throws kaushalya like people know very well that life is not always the same it's going to keep throwing uh, surprises at us and kaushalya like people adjust to the surprises of life and kai kai like people they prefer to focus on project project 
growth. So they are highly successful in business. Sumitra type people, they focus on relationship growth. And Kaushalya like people, they focus on self growth. So for success in business transactions, you need Kaikai type mentality. For success in relationships, you need Sumitra type mentality. But for success in handling challenges in both business and relationship, you need Kaushalya like mentality. Because whenever challenges come both in business, both in work as well as in relationships, and especially those challenges where you have no control of, the only thing you can do is go higher. And that's what Kaushalya does. This is known as self-analysis. The next aspect is known as self-control. This is a very important aspect of life. The first thing in self-control is how to deal with problems. Dealing with negativity is always going to happen in everybody's life. Human evolution is not a matter of chance, but it is a matter of choice. That means every time you come across a problem, how do you spell a problem? Do you call the problem a calamity or an opportunity? People like Arjun, people like Krishna, whenever they come across a problem, they use it as an opportunity for growing. Arjuna, as I said, I give this example of Urvashi, cursing him. So instead of accepting that curse as a problem, Arjuna accepted that curse as a blessing. So he, she had cursed him that he would become a eunuch. So Arjuna utilized that curse for that one year when he was an in incognito, Agyatvas. And one year he actually became a eunuch. And that way the curse actually became a blessing. Krishna, when he was faced with Kaliya, the snake, Kaliya was a massive problem in Vrindavan. Rather than seeing that problem as a highly negative one, Krishna utilized that problem to make it an entertainment. So essentially, Kaliya came as a threat, but he ended up becoming a theater. On Kaliya, Krishna danced. So Kaliya came as a problem, but he ended up giving entertainment to, to Vrindavan, to all the Vrajvasis. So essentially, you cannot solve any problem with the same mindset that creates the problem. Kai Kai created a massive problem in Ramayan, in, in Ayodhya. Ram, he didn't deal with that problem by discussing with Kai Kai. He didn't call for a conference. Because he knew that when somebody's hands are dirty, you're, you know, you're completely immersed in tar and dirt, you can't help that person come out. Somebody who's in quicksand, you can only help when you go out of the quicksand, when you're standing out of the quicksand. So Ram didn't want to, want to enter into the quicksand to help Kaikai come out of the quicksand. He just left. He thought, he gave a very interesting answer, reason why he left. He said, I have always waited for a time when I can actually go to the forest and learn from the sages. So he said, these 14 years are not 14 years of exile. They're 14 years of learning for me. He just walked away, thinking higher. Problems are the best chance to prove your maturity. In the Mahabharata, when the Pandavas were given Khandava Prastha, a barren piece of land, it was a massive problem. You can't do anything in Khandava Prastha. But they transformed that Khandava Prastha into Indra Prastha, which became the most celebrated place on earth, to the extent that Duryodhan got envious of that place. So essentially, when a bad problem comes in contact with a good attitude, it results in an inspirational story. You look at all of the Bhagavat, all of the Mahabharat, all of the Ramayan. Wherever there are inspirational stories, there have been problems that have been dealt with the right attitude. And therefore, we need to understand how to handle negativity. One time, there was a man, young person who was looking for a job. And he approached an MLA to recommend him to a minister for a job. The MLA agreed and he said, you come back to me the next, tomorrow morning, I'll take you to the minister's house. Suddenly the MLA, he smelled something very bad, stinking smell. He realized that this boy's socks are stinking so badly. The MLA told the boy, please don't wear these socks tomorrow. I'll give you a fresh pair of socks. He went and actually bought him a fresh pair of socks and gave him. The boy said, no problem, I promise you I'll wear the new ones. The next day he was come on time wearing the new pair of socks and the MLA was very happy. You know, and he was just taking him to the minister's house. Suddenly, he again could smell something bad. 
So he said, he looked at his socks. The socks were new. He said, why is it smelling again? He removed the socks from his pocket. He said, I wanted to show you that I'm not wearing the old socks. So our mind is exactly like that. Somehow, the stinking pair of socks is compared to the unhappy mind. If the mind is unhappy, even if you're in heaven, you will not feel happy. You will feel frustrated and miserable only. And therefore, it is very important that we deal with, deal with negativity with a lot of positivity and with a lot of uh, positive mindset. There are birds that keep coming into big houses. You know, I, if you even our temple many times you find, if you go to somebody's big houses, you'll find these pigeons, you know, f troubling like anything. So if a bird comes and goes, there's no problem. But if a bird makes a nest, it's a massive problem. That's how the mind is. If negativity comes and goes little here and there, that's not a problem. But if negativity starts staying in your mind constantly all the time, whatever happens in your life, you look at only from a negative point of view. And therefore, it is very important to deal with these negativities immediately. And one simple way to deal with all this negativity is to develop positive attitude. And one very simple way of developing positive attitude is laugh. Laugh regularly. Of course, when I say laugh, you know, people nowadays don't even know how to laugh. <laughs> Most people today, if they laugh, they laugh in laughter therapy clubs, you know. But they all come together and they ha ha ha, they laugh together, you know. If you tell a joke, people don't laugh nowadays. They keep a handkerchief on their face and giggle a little bit, you know. They don't know what's the meaning of loud laughing, you know. When we were in our younger days, our parents, when every night we would have dinner together and 90% of the dinner would be just laughing. Rolling on the ground sometimes laughing. You know. Today, people don't know what laughter is. Next generation is a laughing club generation. The generation after that, lol generation, LOL, laugh out loud, they write and send each other. And next generation after that is smiley generation. They will send a smiley. Big smile means I'm laughing loudly, you know. You should understand that I'm laughing. Therefore, because there is no laughter in people's lives, people's lives are becoming frustrated and there are so many psychological problems. Why do people go to so many psychologists, psychiatrists? One of the reasons is because they don't laugh properly. With any small thing, they start getting irritated. If you're calling up somebody and the fellow doesn't pick up the phone, you get so irritated, you feel like banging the phone on the ground. You know? If you are waiting for somebody and that person delays and waits, for, make you wait for 10 minutes, you feel like going and killing him, catching his neck. You know? So the reason people are so frustrated in life, any small thing happens, if a small child throws something down, you go and start beating up the child. You know? The reason people are so frustrated, so highly negatively charged is because there's no time to, no chance or no opportunity for people to vent it out through the concept of laughter. Worse than negativity is anger. There's an article called, Are You Angry Against Anger? Ang anger in Sanskrit is called as Kamanuja. Kamanuja means the younger brother of desire. So whenever you find the younger brother dissatisfied, some desire is dissatisfied. In the corner, you'll find the older brother coming. Anger is around the corner, basically. So essentially, there are two types of desires. One is needs and one is wants. Needs can be satisfied, but wants can never be satisfied. And therefore, if the trigger point of your anger is an unmet need, then you should work diligently to satisfy that need. But if the trigger point of your anger is an unmet want, you should think twice. Because not all wants can be actually satisfied in life. In the Ramayana we find Vibhishan being the cause of anger of Ravan. Vibhishan counseled Ravan. And in the process of counseling Ravan, he stepped on one un and on a want of Ravan. Ravan wanted autocracy. That means no questions asked. No suggestions given. 
and he wanted absolute autocracy and because Vibhishan by mistake stepped on that oxygen tube of Ravan, you know, oxy Ravan started blasting. Therefore, a person who is angry, he's actually a weak person. A weak person in anger cannot be a strong person in stability. In the Bhagavad, we find the story of King Muchukunda. He blasted on Kalayavan. So Muchukunda had been given this benediction of sleeping for as much time as he wanted. And at that point of time, Krishna tricked Kalayavan to come and to think that Muchukunda is him. So Kalayavan went and kicked Muchukunda like anything. So Muchukunda got up and he was so angry that somebody disturbed my sleep. He looked at him and Kalevan was burnt to ashes. And only when this person got burnt to ashes because of his anger, Muchukunda realized the ill effects of anger, how bad anger is. So essentially, anger is like a black rat that nibbles away the peace of your mind. So whenever you are, so whatever is done in uh, madness of anger, when you look at it at another point of time, it becomes an embarrassment. So those who are angry, actually if you see, they are actually acting like a joker only. So for most people who don't relate to what, what's happening to them, so your anger is trigger point of somebody else's humor. Somebody else is getting free entertainment when you get angry, you know. So you, you observe people who are angry when they, when they are fighting, look at all others. Everybody around them is laughing, having a good time, essentially. And therefore, there's a very interesting quote which says, if you are right, then there is no need to get angry. And if you are wrong, you have no right to get angry. So in both situations, anger is useless or anger is not needed at all. And therefore it said, anyone who angers you actually conquers you. And therefore it is very important that we learn to control anger. I'll end with a very uh, interesting episode. Of course, there is there many more things that we could have spoken, but we will speak it some other time. Tomorrow, we'll definitely continue on relationships. This last episode is going to be about uh, speaking about self-growth. So for most people in life who are successful, they feel success is a result of my endeavor, my effort. But actually, many times, Success can be the cause of your greatest failures. The first word when it comes to, when you, when you talk about the word success, as soon as you talk about the word success, is celebration. People want to celebrate as soon as they're successful. When you are very close to success, it is almost like getting intoxicated. You can't see properly. When a fish is just about to eat its bait, it can't see the hook behind the bait excited about getting the food. Similarly, the desperation to succeed, it kind of makes you blind to the reality and you end up failing. In the Mahabharata, there is a story of uh, Jayadrat. So Jayadrat had killed Abhimanyu, his conspiration behind killing Abhimanyu. And uh, after that, the next day, Arjun took this vow of killing Jayadrat by sunset. So the entire Kaurava army was protecting Jayadrat. And by the end of the day, towards the fag end of the day, Arjun reached Jayadrat. Jayadrat was still far away. But the sun, so Krishna kind of hid the sun, made an artificial sunset. And as soon as Jayadrat saw that the sun had just gone down, he became happy. So he was hidden all this time, protected. Then he jumped out. As soon as he jumped out, Krishna told, shoot. And he removed the covering of the sun. And Arjuna shot his, uh, knocked off his head. So essentially, proximity to success lubricates our secret desire to celebrate our success. And therefore, most people are desperate to hear applause. Desperate to hear, you know, people praising them and all that. And as soon as you reach close to it, almost close to success, you forget that you have still not succeeded. In the, in the Ramayana, we find Ravan in the exact same situation. When he kidnapped Sita, as soon as he kidnapped her, he was convinced that I am successful. But Jatayu attacked him and he killed Jatayu also. And again, Ravan was happy that he, had, he was successful. But what Jatayu didn't make him realize was that there was a muhurta called uh, Vindya muhurta. 
when ravan kidnapped jata uh, sita he was an astrologer he chose the right muhurta to kidnap her he knew this muhurta if i kidnap her then she will not go back to ram so he chose astrologically right muhurta to kidnap her but by fighting with ravan jatayu delayed that muhurta and actually ravan kidnapped uh, sita in the another muhurta which is known as punarvasu and in punarvasu muhurta whoever is the, if you lose a property the property comes back to you so jatayu he lost but he actually won ravan won but he actually lost so many times when you are close to success you forget there are many other factors that are responsible for success and one of the most important factors that is responsible for success is blessings and unless we actually get blessings you can't become successful really the um the family business of the pandavas was to accumulate blessings at every war before the war would begin they would actually take blessings from their seniors in the virat war arjun took blessings from drona and bhishma before fighting in the kurukshetra war yudhishthir personally went into blessings from all the seniors before fighting and because they realized that talent alone cannot give you success so talent alone tends to make one arrogant talent and good attitude makes one malleable or flexible talent good attitude and character makes one trustable talent good attitude character and blessings makes one capable talent good attitude character blessings and grace make one successful but if you really want to ensure that you remain successful along with all this you also need wisdom of wise men and therefore at the end of the mahabharat war arjun and all the pandavas they went to barbaric there was one man named barbaric who had actually offered his head to krishna and the result of that was krishna blessed him that he can see the entire war though only the head is alive at the end of the war they went to barbaric and asked him who was the hero of the war barbaric after hearing all these people because arjuna was thinking he is the hero bhima was thinking i am the hero barbaric after hearing all of them said according to my understanding the entire war all the 18 days the sudarshan chakra of krishna was roaming around and killing everyone and everyone who was eliminated was only eliminated by krishna and therefore i don't see anybody else doing anything except krishna sudarshan chakra doing everything and therefore with the wisdom of barbaric uh, the pandavas they realized that actually what made them win is the blessings of uh, the supreme lord and therefore i'll conclude by this very interesting saying talent is god given be humble fame is man given be grateful but egotism is self given be careful hare krishna thank you very much